For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new issue of People's Health Dispatch. Uh, today, we are going to touch upon a very important point, something that we have covered before also in our bulletin, which is about the diagnostics of COVID-19. Uh, uh, we all know the kind of inequality that exists, and there has been a lot of noise about vaccine inequity. But diagnostics inequity is as big an issue and is as rampant uh, across the world in the co uh, context of COVID. Um, and if we see that um, Israel and Australia, countries, rich countries, are able to uh, uh, diagnose uh, 10 people per thousand population of this, while the poorer nations, such as Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda and others, they can't test even one person per 10,000. And so what are the reasons that such inequality exists and what can we do about it? And what is the science of diagnostics uh, which can inform us as to how to go about a more rational way of investing in diagnostics uh, and making uh, 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 these tests available uh, for everyone? When we talk about track, test and treat a strategy um, for, to contain the pandemic, testing becomes a very important part. Uh, today I have with me Dr. Satyajit Rath. Most of our audience uh, is already quite familiar with him. We have had him before with us and um, he's uh, a scientist and also somebody who has been very close to people, science movements and health movement. Um, so we will be talking to him today. Welcome Satyajit and thanks uh, again for joining us today. Um, so shortly I would just like to begin by asking um, what is the importance of diagnostics? Because, and I'm asking this because uh, about vaccines and therapeutics, there is a fair amount of understanding and we talk about it more often, uh, but diagnosis is as important. So if you can shed some light from a public health point of view also, it will be great. Yeah, yeah. so um, let's start with diagnosing COVID-19 or um, the virus SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and there are two layers to the significance of accurately and sensitively identifying if somebody is infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus and therefore has COVID-19 illness, whether it's asymptomatic, mild, moderate, or severe. At the individual level, it's important for people to know because the symptoms, particularly the initial symptoms, um, everybody knows a cough, um, uh, fever perhaps, body ache, sometimes loss of uh, the sense of smell and taste. These are all very general. So it's not as if symptoms alone tell you if you have this particular virus or not. At the individual level, why is it important for you to know whether you have this particular virus or not? Number one, for people with comorbidity, for elderly people, for people with uh, substantial obesity, for people with substantial diabetes, high, high blood pressure, um, there is the possibility of uh, developing severe illness a few days down the road. And it's important to know whether what you have is COVID infection or not. Secondly, it's also possible that you may not develop severe COVID-19 illness, but what you may develop is long COVID. And in order to know whether uh, what you have eventually is long COVID or not, it's important to have had viral virus diagnosis early on in the illness. Thirdly, now that oral antiviral pills have become available, uh, one uh, that uh, Merck has done the uh, final development on, one that Pfizer has done development on, um, those medicines can be taken orally. And therefore, at least in principle, if you are diagnosed early to have the virus, you can start the medicine and we can talk about whether medicines are actually accessible or not separately, but at least in principle, you can start medication and you can reduce your chances of getting severe illness and you can help your community by remaining transmission capable for a much shorter period of time. That's at the individual level. At the community level, it's important for us to be able to track 
how much infection with the virus is happening. And in order for us to be able to track it so that we can identify clusters and outbreaks, we can build precisely directed um, containment measures. We can direct, we can uh, design precisely targeted vaccination, drug treatment, hospital critical care related efforts um, to specific communities, to specific neighborhoods. It's important to be able to track the virus. So from both a community point of view and from an individual point of view, it's absolutely critical for diagnostic testing to be able to detect footprints of the virus for the COVID pandemic. So uh, this brings us to another important question, which is about the kind of diagnostics, the science of diagnostics, because uh, we all know we have been told constantly that RT-PCR is the golden standard uh, for diagnosing COVID, uh, but at the same time, it is a very laboratory-based testing that can be done. You need a state-of-the-art laboratory for that, and therefore it cannot be scaled up. And that brings us to then talking about rapid diagnostic testing. Uh, but can you explain more? And do you think the way we have gone about testing in the past two years was the only way to do the science of it? And there was no other way out. Okay. So in the first place, rather than talking about RT-PCR versus rapid tests, let's talk about what the crucial difference between two major methodological categories, method categories. One method category detects the RNA of the virus, the genetic code of the virus. The other major detection category detects viral protein. Now, virus, virus particles come as little packages with an outside that is protein and the genetic code packaged inside. So you'd say, you're either detecting the genetic code, which is RNA, or you're detecting the, the packaging, which is the protein. What's the difference? There is a major difference. The major difference is when you detect a protein or when you detect the genetic code, you're trying to detect with very high sensitivity and with very high accuracy. Sensitivity means that you're detecting really, really small numbers of virus particles in the, in, in, in the phlegm, in the snot, in whatever, in, in uh, fluids, body fluids. Um, specificity, accuracy means that you're actually detecting only this virus and not some other related virus. Both protein detection and genetic code detection is pretty specific, it's pretty accurate for SARS-CoV-2. There are, there are uh, reservations that we'll come to in a minute. But as far as sensitivity is concerned, here's the problem. How many particles can I detect if I'm using protein detection? And in, in order to detect protein, I need something that recognizes protein. We use antibodies for this. That's why it's, they are called rapid antigen testing because they bind to antibodies. The rapid antigen tests, antibody-based tests, can be amplified, but only to a certain extent. So the detection sensitivity of protein detection methods is less than the detection sensitivity of genetic code detection methods, because the genetic code can be amplified to a much larger extent. And therefore, because the amplification capacities of protein detection versus RNA detection are quite different. RNA detection is more sensitive than protein detection. So if you and I had the choice, which one would we prefer given that both of them are equally accurately specific, but one is more sensitive than the other, we would say we want the more sensitive one. The more sensitive one, which is the genetic code detection one, depends currently for 80 plus percent of the diagnostics market on the, as you pointed out, the RT-PCR. The trouble with the RT-PCR is that it is dependent on the polymerase chain reaction. And that particular piece of a biochemical process depends on very rapid heating and very rapid cooling. 
scores of times, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 times in very quick succession in sort of one minute intervals. In order to do that, you need an electronically controlled rapid heating, rapid cooling block. That's why the instrument is called a thermal cycler, essentially a rapid, quick heating, quick cooling, quick heating, quick cooling um, element. So the real question is, this instrument has to be available. All the electronic paraphernalia with computerized control has to be available. And that's what you meant when you said that uh, a, a, um, at least a secondary, if not a tertiary level laboratory resource has to be available for this testing, which means that decentralized point of care, scarce resource community-based testing is simply impossible for the RT-PCR. Can, can I build an antibody-based based test that is available as point of care? Absolutely, yes. A large number of lateral flow-based antigen testing, rapid antigen testing, is that kind of testing. So here's the distinction. The antigen testing is available as point of care, but is not terribly sensitive. The RT-PCR is very sensitive, but is not available as decentralized community-based point of care testing. The really crucial question to ask is, is this a gap that cannot be bridged? And that's clearly not the case. Why am I saying this? Empirical evidence says that it is not the case. So let me give two quick examples from here, from India, where the genetic code of the virus, the RNA, can be identified using molecular biochemical technologies that do not require this rapid heating and cooling and therefore can actually be designed to provide a very much decentralized close to point of care test. One of those was developed, we're talking about 2020, was developed by a government of India funded institution in Delhi called the Institute for Genomics and Integrative Biology, IGIB. They called it Peluda for a variety of uh, reasons that we will not get into that are India specific cultural reasons. Um, and that test is a test that doesn't depend on high end instrumentation at its implementation. Exactly similarly, at the other end of India, in Trivandrum, in Kerala, again, a government of India funded institution um, called the Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Science and Technology um, developed yet another technology that again does not depend on rapid heating and cooling that identifies the RNA code of the virus with high sensitivity. And again, that test was also supposed to have been transferred to the private market and to have become widely available. The crucial question to ask is, who was manufacturing these? Who was selling these? Who was buying these? Are these technologies which are far more people friendly, which have been developed in people funded, taxpayer money funded uh, uh, public, science institutions, why is the structure of the pandemic response configured in such a fashion that these have not become huge, very large scale manufactured and prominently available? Why is it that RT-PCRs, more than a year after these technologies were transferred to manufacturing units, why is it that RT-PCRs are still the tests of choice. That's the crucial issue. I agree. And, and wow, I mean, this sounds like something which could have been done like better testing with more specificity from the beginning, um, or at least since, the, uh, since late 2020, and we have not been able to do it. Uh, but that is a question that, why would you say that is the case? Because we know the kind of uh, work that was being done at the level of WHO, WHO brought out guidelines after guidelines where uh, there was, uh, we just know about RT-PCR based testing. Uh, there is, has hardly been any discussion and uh, uh, even uh, in ACTA, the ACT accelerator, which is 
which we were told uh, in the April 2020 that it is going to solve all inequity that can come up, which was quite anticipated during COVID-19, but it has completely failed. Um, in ACTA, the one thing that we notice is there are different pillars uh, uh, and uh, the diagnostic pillar has been able to attract funding uh, only something like 8 to 10 percent of the total funding for the vaccine pillar. So, so clearly there is a problem in terms of focus, um, maybe also in terms of wanting uh, to even diagnose the common population or the poorer population. Do you think so too? Well, um, let me put it slightly differently. Let, let me put it to, uh, in terms of the perspective through which the global response to the COVID pandemic, but with particular reference to the global South, but not simply to the global South, also to marginalized communities in the global North has been, ha has been configured. And that entire configuration has been one of top-down decision-making and not simply top-down decision-making. It has an element of charity in it, which means that the great philanthropies, the foundations that shall not be named, um, which are, which are uh, um, major non-state actors in configuring these, these decisions, all of them tend to think in terms of the current structure where profit-making companies, um, biotech, pharma, instrument company sectors, which all intersect with each other, um, remember that the diagnostic tests are not made necessarily by pharma companies alone. They're also made by other companies, but they are all part of an integrated sector, which is also integrated with health manufacturing, health instrumentation related manufacturing technologies. And it's that complexly and seamlessly configured for profit sector, which is taken as a given by both state and non state funders when they are thinking about delivering what I'm calling charity to the global South. And therefore, what the, the way that this is configured is inevitably to say, we're going to have to develop, uh, deliver tests in large numbers. We are inevitably, we are going to deliver, of course, more tests to the global North than to the global South. We are going to try and reduce the gap, at least for appearances sake, but we are going to have to deliver quite a few tests, quite a few vaccines, quite a few everything to the global South at costs that are not high profit costs, how can we offset the revenue loss? We can offset it by selling instruments to the global south with which these tests have to be done. And much of this is a complex spider web of um, trade-offs to try and minimize profit losses in what is an inevitable large scale charity driven response to the problem. And as a consequence of this, the overwhelming presence in the COVID diagnostic market still remains the certified, the familiar, the branded RT-PCR tests with their affiliated um, technologies. Let me ask, let me add a final point to this um, of players and actors in this configuration. And those are the private sector healthcare delivery systems. The, uh, I speak uh, about Indian experiences, the private healthcare laboratories, diagnostic laboratories, which have been doing in India a great deal of diagnostic testing. And for them also, this is familiar territory, this, this complex web of Pharma companies, diagnostic manufacturing companies, um, healthcare instrumentation manufacturing companies, and um, diagnostic laboratories on the ground at the secondary level in towns and so on and so forth. It's this complex web of the for profit sector that is the dominant presence that's shaping the entirety of the response. It's no surprise that point of care tests especially high sensitivity point of care tests have had no traction. So uh, uh, I think uh, we all in India heard about Feluda tests so much because uh, at one point, everybody thought that is going to 
uh, be the test uh, in India because it was going to be cheap uh, as well. And you are saying that there are other efforts also. We also know that in Malaysia as well, uh, some uh, similar testing has come up. Many organizations are actually calling for local production, local research, and then local production uh, of diagnosis uh, in uh, primarily in the developing countries, be it Africa or Asia. Um, uh, there has been another strand where uh, activists and uh, organizations, civil society organizations, have been asking uh, organizations or companies like CFIT to bring the price down of their tests because the production cost is so low and they are just making a killing during the pandemic, which is so unethical. Um, considering this entire landscape, uh, what do you think should be the response of WHO ideally? We all know that WHO is uh, uh, did, uh, their work now in, is increasingly being determined by, as you said, philanthropies that shall not be named, uh, and uh, other organizations, see fit, find, and all of them. Uh, but what should they be doing? And I would again request you to put shed some light as a scientist or in terms of science as to what can they look at and bring these tests into their pre-qualification uh, the, the entire dossier so that others can start to use it. Well, certainly um, having a WHO imprimatur of approval um, helps credibility for any you know, product in, that includes these tests. But frankly, the World Health Organization is essentially a coordinating office and it coordinates what's available and what its funders press it to coordinate. So it's no surprise that this combination of state and non-state actors that are functioning in what I'm pointing out is a, a configured for-profit web of, of uh, um, the health, the industrial, and the um, healthcare delivery diagnostic sector is going to be focused on what they are focused on. My argument is that we in public health activism need to be demanding of our governments, and we should have been doing this this past year and a half, but in the era of emerging variant strains, there is still very much reason for us to be demanding much wider testing, much more agile, nimble, flexible testing, testing to be developed for sensitive yet decentralized point of care methodologies and for these to be taken out of the for-profit sector by using public health networks. All countries of the global south have some measure of public health networks. India's public health networks, for example, go all the way to the primary health care, uh, primary health centers, which have very basic elementary laboratories. Can we deliver reagent packages, chemical packages that allow primary health care centers to do testing at their levels? Can we make the research institutions that are publicly funded develop these? Can we use public health, uh, public sector manufacturing facilities simply to put these packages together? Can we use in countries like India, the wanted clinical epidemiological expertise in place for building a, um, a quality assurance, quality control network for these entirely in the public health domain outside the for-profit network and deliver rapid nimble testing that's modified and tweaked as variants arise for large scale tests to be available free to people everywhere on demand. That's really going to be, that's, that's always been a crucial component that has been understated, that's always going to remain for the next few months uh, as, as uh, variants emerge and spread, that's going to remain the issue. One last point on that, until now, we didn't even have oral antiviral drugs so that when people uh, with 24 hours of symptoms, even if they felt 
battling against all the stigmatization that has happened, even if they felt like they would go get a test done, number one, tests haven't been available, but even if tests were available, what would they do with a positive test uh, apart from self-isolation, which is economically disabling for many people? Now, it is possible for us to say, track, test, and treat on a large scale has become feasible with oral antiviral drugs. Why are those drugs, and I come full circle on this, why are those drugs not being manufactured under compulsory licensing in large amounts and being made available to the people? Why is that drug availability not being coupled to widespread decentralized point of care testing so that communities and individuals can be empowered to deal with their health individually and collectively in their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Satyajit. I think this was really good and uh, not only in terms of learning about the science of diagnostics, but also understanding uh, that uh, how uh, different uh, everything is so interlinked that if you need diagnosis, uh, you also need treatment. And now that we have, how important diagnosis becomes in itself. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for watching this. And we will be bringing you more such uh, in-depth uh, interviews. And as you know, that we try to cover the political economy of health in our People's Health Dispatch and not just give you news. Uh, so keep coming back. Thank you so much. Thank you.